All right. Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody to another uh, installment of a virtual Behind the Baton. This is our series of talks before our Topeka Symphony concerts. And uh, last year we had launched this series at the Topeka Library. And of course, this year we are doing them on the YouTube channel and Facebook page of the Topeka Library. And we're very grateful for that collaboration here. Uh, this is a chance to talk uh, especially about um, Oh, special elements of the concert. It's not just a pre-concert talk about, uh, about the background of the pieces, but when we have a soloist, I will often talk to a soloist. In this case, we are giving the world premiere of a set of orchestral accompaniments to songs by none other than Gordon McQuare, who is a Topeka composer and the former board president of the Topeka Symphony. Uh, welcome, Gordon. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be on your program. Well, thanks for joining me for this virtual broadcast. It's always more fun to do it in person, you know, because then we have more direct connection to the uh, to the people who can ask questions. But so today I will ask you the questions and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about your piece. Uh, I'm really excited to be doing this. You know, this is the 75th anniversary of the Topeka Symphony. You and I had talked about doing these prior to the pandemic. So, you know, the, the intention, it was just part of the celebration of 75 years of the Topeka Symphony. Uh, then the pandemic hit and, uh, and it seemed, even though I had to reprogram a lot of things, uh, this concert seemed like it would work really well, even though it had singing, which can be a little bit, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were a lot, quite a bit worried about what that meant. Um, but now, actually, things uh, there's been a lot of studies. We feel like we could do this safely. And in fact, Jennifer's had her vaccination, so she's she's good to go. I mean, I, I'm actually going to have her sing without a mask um, with the audience. When we rehearse, she'll rehearse with a mask. But uh, so I think I think we're fine in that regard. Uh, tell me a little bit if you could just just describe for us uh, because it's a world premiere. You know, no one in our audience has heard these before. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about the, the pieces and what they are. If this is a, a set of four songs, all loosely related around uh, the concept of aspects of love. And it's done by two Victorian era English poets. The poems are, um, this is Christina Rossetti and her brother Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It was, it's a very interesting family and maybe later in the, in the half hour, we can talk a little about that aspect of it. Uh, she is fairly well known for a couple of Christmas things that get done a lot uh, in the bleak midwinter is perhaps the most familiar one. And he was also uh, a noted painter and his art is still sought after. Um, very unusual for anyone to be creative at a high level in more than one arts field. It, it does happen, but this is a good example. Schoenberg, for example, painted as well, but there aren't very many of those. And uh, I liked what I knew of hers and I started exploring his and, and decided over time, it's a complex story of how this all came to be, but to put together uh, four poems, two of each, and set them. And so uh, the beginnings of all this was uh, two of the songs had earlier individual lives. And then uh, the set as a whole exists also in a version for uh, soprano, violin, and piano. And uh, frankly, it's never been heard as a whole in that version, just the two individual pieces. And uh, uh, the, uh, up, the idea came up, the opportunity came up to orchestrate them. And it turns out it worked pretty well. For me, it was a, it was a growing experience too, to uh, uh, take something that's written for one medium and redo it to fit another one. And I learned a lot from it. It was great fun to do. The uh, language I use is something that is, I think, appropriate for Victorian era poetry. It's 
fairly chromatic, but it's not real dissonance. I try dissonant. I try to use dissonance as a, a way of enhancing the words and making them come alive, not just to, to sound modern, say. Um, I tried to stay very lyrical. I, I've written a fair amount for voices, and I always think that you're best if you write for voices with things that have good and fairly long lines. Uh, a really good singer can sing all sorts of disjunct things, but that's not as effective. Um, if you go to the Met or the Kansas City Lyric Opera and you hear the great operas, you hear these wonderful long lined tunes. And that's what works well with voice, in my opinion. So I try uh, to yeah. I, I totally agree. You know, when uh, when I studied voice, I studied voice uh, alongside flute and conducting. And, and one of my, my first serious voice teacher um, had done had a had a working relationship with Milton Babbitt and had recorded a lot of his songs. And, you know, it's so disjointed. I mean, just beep up. I mean, with <laughs> really without is. any apparent logic there. I mean, there's absolutely logic, but without any apparent logic to it. Right. And right. it's not um, not idiomatic to the voice. And I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, it's the it's the lyric long lines that really highlight what the voice can do as an instrument um and right. and i think um your your songs are they're all beautiful each all four of them are very very beautiful um and you know i think sometimes people worry about hearing new music that that they're not going to like it that it's going to be harsh that it's going to somehow bother their ears uh, and that's that's absolutely not the case with these pieces, with with without question. And honestly, I think for almost everything that's being written these days, composers have a very good awareness of what audiences enjoy hearing. And and I wonder if you can comment on that because we definitely went through a period of time in the 20th century when, I mean, let's let's just peg it from say the late 50s to through the 80s or 90s where exactly uh, right. A lot of new music was pretty unpleasant. Um, you know, can you can you speak to that? I mean, you you absolutely. Yeah, uh, I went to uh, graduate school as a composer at the University of Iowa. My master's is in composition, and that was in the early seventies, and uh, that was an era when, if anything you wrote sounded in the least appealing, it was just considered not worthy. Right. And it was just it was just that era. Some some thinkers uh, chalk it up to uh, the nuclear age and, and other kinds of pressures and tensions. I don't know if that's true or not, but you can see the parallel at least. Right. And thank goodness we got out of that eventually. In fact, I'll tell you a, a, a tiny anecdote about it. This was would have been in 1974 or so. Uh, we had a visiting composer come. His name is George Rockberg. He was very much out of that serial dissonant tradition. And our performers played one of his new pieces, which was a piece for cello and piano that sounded like Beethoven. And we were, of course, flabbergasted by it, but it led to a very fruitful discussion about this sort of thing. And I think that was the first time I became aware that the, the, the winds had changed direction in a manner of speaking. And so, as you say, now uh, you hear these wonderful pieces. We've heard some great ones at the Topeka Symphony, uh, the violin concerto that Tessa Lark played right, uh, a year ago. Michael Torch. Very attractive, engaging music. Yep. Um, I've never felt that my goal as a composer was to write beautiful music. Sometimes I think, I hope, I've succeeded. Perhaps there are spots here in Rossetti songs that would fall under that. But I do want to write music that is attractive, let's say, in the sense that it engages the listener. I think that is an important goal, certainly is one for me. Now, in this case, you have text to help drive right. your um your style, as it were, uh, because you are 
creating a musical representation of 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 words um, or at least right. a musical setting of those words and so in in many ways it has to be appropriate to that so does that affect the way that you uh i, I mean they're beautiful poems and i think you have written beautiful music to go with those beautiful poems does that is, i assume that's conscious and on purpose absolutely yeah absolutely yeah i think uh, i have written probably oh three quarters of the stuff i've written has been vocal has it has had words and as you would know, and perhaps many of your listeners, uh, composers might have a variety of starting points for their creative process. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Benjamin Britten, who always seems to respond positively and brilliantly to a terrific poem. And he had a flawless eye for finding a good one. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, Stravinsky, uh, one of the truly great composers, uh, says himself that the starting point for him was always a rhythm. That's pretty evident in his music. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> you yeah. say, well, yeah, I kind of think that's right. Yeah. And for somebody else, it might be a chord progression or it might be a melodic fragment. All of those are perfectly valid and lead to somewhat different results. So for me, uh, it, when I'm writing with words, I, I get to know the words, the poem, very, very thoroughly. And I wait for some line in it to jump out at me. I can give you, I'll give you a really good example from this piece. This yeah. is a number three called uh, Sudden Light. And it, it reflects Dante Gabriel's uh, belief in reincarnation. And the poet is somewhere out with a loved one and uh, he has this kind of deja vu experience that, that this has all happened previously. And at the end, he says, shall we not lie as we have lain thus for love's sake and sleep and wake, yet never break the chain? And when I read that the first time, I was just captured by that image that he creates there and uh, that made a starting point then for the whole song. Yeah. So for me, yes, it's very much from the words. I, I want to play in just a moment. We'll, I want to play an example because, you know, right. like we've said people listening right now, they don't, they don't have any context for what we're talking about. So we'll, we'll do that. But before I do that, you know, you said something at the beginning that I wanted to come back to you and I could talk probably all day, but we're limited to about a half an hour here. But um, you mentioned um, that they, these you originated these for, for voice and piano, and then you added the violin. Is that oh, true? Oh, it's not quite that simple. Okay. Uh, the fourth song is the oldest one, okay. remember. And that started out as part of a, of a song cycle for, uh, well, it was actually Lee and Anne Marie Snook, who many of your listeners yeah. uh, know. And uh, so for baritone and mezzo, with six instruments accompanying them. Oh, okay. And this was one of the songs out of uh, nine, I guess, that were in that cycle. It was all about time. So remember in that sense. Right. Um, then the uh, second song, which is called, um, I should know my own song names. Silent Noon. Right. Wow, that's a, just a, a lapse. Silent Noon, uh, which is one of Dante's, um, I wrote actually, this, this isn't even in the program notes, I wrote it as a, um, a gift to my uh, wife on, her, on our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And at the point where I wrote that, it was for soprano, violin, and piano. Okay. And so then little by little, I hatched this notion of making a cycle out of it. And that's when all four of these came up in this chamber version of soprano violin and orchestra. Right. And so the, the two of them that are completely new, number one and number three, uh, I haven't heard in any version yet. So I'm okay. particularly excited to hear them. Those are, those are complete premieres. The others are premieres in the orchestra sets. 
Well, I'm going to compare you for a moment to Mahler here. Um, oh boy, that's heavy comparison. Well, it is, but you know, there's a similarity because he was especially attracted to to the voice and poetry as well and you know we tend we think about Mahler for his large symphonies which are mostly orchestral although almost every one of his symphonies or at least the first five symphonies uh, the the melodies and the tunes come from settings of songs that he wrote we call them the Desknaben Wunderhorn symphonies because that that collection of poetry inspired him to write so many songs and then he would take those songs and he would take the melodies put them in the symphonies sometimes actually bring the singer in as we saw with the fourth symphony um, or the second symphony and the, the singers join in um, but he actually has a, a, a few song cycles um, that where he wrote the the cycle for piano and singer and then later orchestrated those correct um, as as complete sets of orchestral songs and that's really what this is i mean now you have orchestral songs yes it is and and those ones of his are are really amazingly successful i'm very fond of them and there's a way in which just parenthetically that those early symphonies that draw on that cycle really are song-like in that sense some people yeah. say schubert's are that way and i i think i agree um but it, they work both ways beautifully so i wondered if the question in here is were you influenced have you been influenced by Mahler in the in the way that he turns his piano voice pieces into orchestra voice pieces did you study that at all did you think about that when you were doing this you know i did turn to models for this yeah and i didn't find a sufficient help in Mahler because his orchestra is so much bigger than I'm using. Right. He's such a first rate orchestrator, something I can only aspire to. I did find, in fact, uh, Kyle, it was your suggestion. I did find some, um, some help, some ideas in uh, Samuel Barber. Oh, good. And I've always been influenced by Barber to one degree or another. Uh, not just in a work like Knoxville, Summer of 1915, which we've heard here with Topeka Symphony, brilliant work for voice and orchestra, but also uh, the violin concerto, which I know really well, and thinking, okay, what, what do you do? What makes a soloist and this very large ensemble, what makes that work? Right. And so he was really helpful. Some more... Uh, I think influences would be another would be uh, Ralph Vaughan Williams. Oh yeah, yeah. And people have people have smelled that in my compositions from time to time, and it's actually okay. I I don't mind being uh, compared to somebody good. Yeah. Well, let's let's listen. Um, do you want to introduce the the this recording? It's it's obviously not. Uh, this is Silent Noon. Um, this is not the full orchestra because there is no recording of the full orchestration that will be uh, premiered on on our concert here. But do you want to just Great. mention a little bit about this piece? And we'll just you know it's it's about four minutes long, um, and we'll let people hear a sense. I, I think I think people should know what kind of beautiful music they're getting into on this one. Oh, it's kind. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the one I had done for my for my wife, and I used violin and soprano in part because I have a daughter who's a professional violinist and, it's, and another daughter who's a very accomplished amateur soprano. And while I haven't heard the two of them sing it, uh, it did occur here with my violinist daughter playing the violin part and another soprano. And uh, I was very happy with the result. And okay. uh, so this is the chamber version. Well, let me, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'll share the screen. So there's not really much for people to look at, but I will, um, I'll share the screen and the sound and um, we'll listen to the piece together. Thank you. 
it's gorgeous. I mean, what a what a beautiful song that is. Thank you so much. And uh, and I'm I'm really excited to to hear it with the full orchestra. Me I'm, too. Let me ask this. This is this is. I mean, again, we we could talk all day, but we don't. We only have a half an hour. But this might be a big question. But when you are when you are when you wrote these, because you had the chamber ensemble in mind, I, you certainly had piano and, and violin, and so the violin gives you a sense of of where you might be going when you're orchestrating it. Do you sometimes I feel composers uh, and even some of the greatest composers, you know. Brahms certainly when or early in his career, um, uh, Schubert, Schumann, you know, the, you could feel the piano translated into the orchestra in a way that is awkward or difficult for the orchestra. I mean, things that the piano can do, don't you? You know, with the left hand, the orchestra doesn't do very well. So, I, I'm sure you're aware of that. What? How did you? How did you think about that when you're translating the piano music into the orchestra? That, that's absolutely the right question. And uh, I'll try and make the answer real compact. You just can't think like a, it's a piano part. You have to say, what am I trying to do? And I was trying to do that in a piano sort of way. And now I've got to do it in an orchestra sort of way. So there was a surprising amount of what I would say total recomposition that went into the orchestra version of these in order to avoid that very problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask another question. You mentioned the, you, you said, you used the term already, and I was going to talk to you about that. You said something about dissonance, that, that you use dissonance uh, to highlight something in the text. And when I, when I get concerns from audience members about new music, what I often will hear is, I don't want to hear a lot of dissonance. I don't want to hear something that's dissonant. And and I know what they mean, but there's a difference between what they mean and what dissonance is in music. You bet. And, and I say, you know, do you like the music of Bach? And they say, oh, I love Bach. And Bach is full of dissonance. I mean, Bach is all about dissonance. And and let's see if I can encapsulate this right. You tell me if you feel the same way as a composer, but I think um, in the music of Bach, in the music of, well, in the music of every composer, Dissonance is a means to which, a means by which we can get to resolution. So it's a it's a way of creating tension that then resolves. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I might I might go one step further. I might say resolving the dissonance into consonance, which goes all the way back to the Renaissance, um, is maybe the number one reason or number one way of handling dissonance. But I think you could say in a larger sense, dissonance has to be there for a reason. Okay. It can't I, just be there because I want to put something in that's a little bit edgy. Uh, the, um, I, we, we won't play it now, but you'll hear it. The, the second to the last thing in the last song, in Remember, is a big complex altered ninth chord that's actually fairly dissonant mm -hmm. but it, it's it, the goal was to kind of capture the, the 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 underlying pain in that text of that last song mm -hmm. of separation and then resolve that into peace you know i think i think what i've often said um what bothers people about some of the newer music that or that period that we talked about is not dissonance. It's that the dissonance never resolves satisfactorily, or it never, it doesn't go where you want it to go. There's something in our body that feels where something is supposed to go, and whether you're a trained musician or not, right? I mean, we have a Absolutely. sense where something is stressed, and then it it releases, and then it feels good. I mean, I think there's catharsis you know, kind of perpetual catharsis in music. A composer sets up something and then it, it resolves and then we feel good about it. And, and that's exactly what happens in life. Which is what happens and in life, right. Times of tension or pressure or hard work and then that relaxes and we feel, we feel so wonderful. And one of the reasons music is so important to so many people is that it helps us 
it reflects those things that are a part of our real lives. Right. And, um, and, and you can think about composers. I mean, I, I think about Wagner in particular. I mean, if you think about, about Tristan and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, you know, the prelude and the, and the love death, the Liebestod, I think one of the things that's really interesting about, about Wagner in there is he sets up a dissonance and then instead of resolving to a consonance, he resolves to another dissonance. Yes. And then resolves to another dissonance. And he creates a chain of these resolutions that don't exactly resolve. And, and thereby he can kind of string out the tension for a really long time so that when he finally resolves it to the consonants, it's, it's a huge catharsis. Yeah, that last chord in the love death in uh, in Tristan is just is the most satisfying chord in the it whole really world is. because of what you've been through. And uh, and I don't hear pe people don't complain about that dissonance. I mean, because because it eventually goes where it's supposed to go. Um, in your music, I think that uh, one of the things that's instantly appealing about it is that it goes where you think it's supposed to go. It takes you on a journey to get there, but it does go where it, where it feels like it needs to. And, and in part, that's just me. And in part, that is to reflect the kind of language that is in these poems. So we're almost out of time. And, but I want to ask a question related specific, specifically to our orchestra and your writing. Now, people know, or some people know, that you were the president of the board of the symphony. Um, for quite a few years, um, right after I was hired. Um, and uh, I, uh, I've always enjoyed working with you. You know, one of the things that you do that very few board members in my experience as a conductor uh, have done is that you, you come to many, you come to at least one rehearsal of every set that we play. Oh, yeah. And I know that, you know, that's because you're a musician, that's because you're a theorist and a composer and you enjoy the process. Um, but you know our orchestra really well because of that. Is that, is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, you have been there um, at various points. I mean, always in the performance, but as a musician, you know, I often feel like it's much more, rehearsal's much more interesting than performance. Uh, you know, the performance is the product and that's great. And, and I love that. But, you know, if you give me the chance to go see a rehearsal of the Chicago Symphony or a performance, I, I'd rather go to the rehearsal. I, I want to see... I want to see the music being made. So what do you get, what have you gotten out of watching the rehearsal process? And then how did that impact your composition of the pieces? When I, when it's possible, I take along a copy of the score. Right. And to, to whatever we're playing. Rehearsal, when I'm in rehearsal, I look at and listen to and understand the piece in a completely different way from that of my other hat, which is as a music theorist. Mm -hmm. I can analyze a piece and I can learn a great deal about it in my own way. But at a rehearsal, I learn about different things. And often they've had tremendously positive effects on my musicianship as a whole, my composition and so on. And besides, it's just really interesting how this all goes together what kinds of things you as the music director work on with the orchestra, how that clarifies a rhythm or brings out a line, and balances a chord. And these are really, really important parts, components in the overall success. You know, uh, I, when, I, when I have worked over the years with conducting students, and, and I mean, heck, when I've been a conducting student, there's always the question, you know, how much music, how much theory analysis does a conductor do or need to do in order to conduct the piece? And it's always a bit of a dilemma. I mean, obviously, the better you know the piece, the better you understand it, for sure. But, um, you know, you mentioned the, the ninth chord. You know, I will sometimes ask my students, how do you conduct a ninth chord? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, it's the answer is you can't. I mean, there's nothing that you can do to conduct. How do you conduct a, a C in the oboe? <laughs> you, you, you can't conduct. Right. Now, you have to know that the oboe is playing a C because there are times when the oboe doesn't play that C and you need to correct that. But and you have to know that there's a ninth chord because you may need to tune it or balance it based on what that chord is. 
But yeah, the decision making process for the music making is very different than the the analytical skills that a theorist would use when writing a paper about a piece or or something. Oh. That right. And, and then you could add what a music historian does by putting a piece in context and you could add what individual performers might write about a piece and how you would prepare that and how they would conceive of the phrasing or the lines or, or the goals and so on. And all of these are really, in my opinion, really valid and important forms of analyzing a piece of music. Theorists do it a certain way that leads to a kind of structural understanding that's really important. But the older I get, the more I realize it also leaves out all these other really fascinating parts of it. And if you put them all together, then you start feeling like you have a sense of what's going on. Yeah, well, now we're past our time, but I'm gonna go with one more thing. This is sort of how we always go. One more thing here, which is, you know, um, I've had your music for some months. Jennifer, our soloist has had your music. Um, you've, you've written several times. Do you have any questions? And, you know, one of the things that I have done when I do works by living composers, especially if it's a premiere and the composer's there is, you know, I like to treat your music in the first stages as though you were Brahms or Beethoven and I don't have access to you because my process of learning the music and making the decisions on how to perform, um, I think is best done from the page. And then, um, and then, of course, we're pre-taping this. So we're, pre we're, we're recording this before we do our first rehearsal, which is coming this weekend. Um, then when we do our first rehearsal and we, and we actually put the sound out there, then you get to hear it. We hear it together. That's when we start making some decisions together. Oh, this worked really, really well. This maybe didn't work as much, you know, this maybe didn't come off exactly. the page the way that I thought about it, the way you thought about it, you know, how do we make adjustments, which is not to say, how do we change the music? It's the same practice that we have when we're doing it. You know, when you do a Beethoven symphony, you've got balance issues because we've got a different orchestra than Beethoven had. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that process, especially because you know our orchestra so well that uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, uh, an awful lot of fun. And, and I'm just really privileged to be working on these pieces. And, and I think people are gonna really, really enjoy them. Well, thank you. You're very kind. And I want to say thank you to you, to uh, Jennifer Forney, our marvelous soprano, and to all the musicians of the Topeka Symphony for uh, doing it. I'm looking forward to it so much. It uh, should be great for all of us. Thank you. Gordon, thank you so much for joining us for Behind the Baton. And My pleasure. Uh, as I said, we could have gone all day, but we'll we'll stop with this and uh, and we'll let people enjoy the pieces. And uh, happily, we are back to some live audience, which is really exciting. Yes. Very, very pleased about that. But we will also be live streaming the performance. And so people can see it in person or on the live stream. And uh, and I, I, I know that people are going to really enjoy your pieces. So. Gordon, thanks again. We will uh, we'll end this, and and uh, when I end it, it will uh, save the recording, and then people will get to to watch this uh, virtually whenever they want to. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gordon. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.